Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2024 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of the foreword to the collection Marxism-Leninism versus Revisionism by Max Weiss from 1946. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. There are links to Patreon and buy me a coffee in the video description. So, as discussed in the recently uploaded introductory video, we are embarking on a mini-series related to the first wave of U.S. anti-revisionism, 1946 to 1958. This particular struggle was fought against the revisionist leadership of Earl Browder, General Secretary of the Communist Party of the U.S. For more background on that, do check out the introductory video uploaded just before this one. A lot of the readings we're going to do for this mini-series do come from this collection, Marxism-Leninism vs. Revisionism, although I do plan to add in other readings as well, but without further ado, here's the foreword. The struggle against and repudiation of Browder's revisionism of Marxism-Leninism constitutes an historic stage in the development of the Communist Party of the United States. A whole period has elapsed since the Special National Convention, held on July 26-28, 1945, which decisively rejected Browder's policies and reconstituted the Communist Party. In this period, life itself has added overwhelming evidence of the complete bankruptcy of Browder's revisionist policies, at the same time that it has fully confirmed the correctness of the policies adopted by the National Convention and further developed by the meeting of the National Committee of the Communist Party, held on November 16-18, 1945. This period has seen the development of big strike struggles instead of the era of class peace and harmony envisaged by Browder. It has seen the growth of unemployment and the maturing of all elements which, despite the possibility of a short-lived upturn in production, will lead inevitably to a new cyclical crisis instead of an era of uninterrupted flourishing of American capitalist economy as forecast by Browder. It has seen armed intervention in China by American imperialism on the side of the reactionary Chiang Kai-shek, bloody armed suppression of the national liberation struggles of the Indonesian people by British and Dutch imperialism, instead of the liberation of the colonies through arrangements between the imperialist powers as envisaged by Browder. It has shown that the Tehran Agreement did not change the nature of American and British imperialism, and that Big Three unity as the cornerstone of enduring peace must be fought for if it is to be maintained, and if departures from it, as at the London Conference, are to be checked and reversed. If Browder's revisionist policies had not been rejected, and if the Communist Party had not been reconstituted, it could not now be playing the vital role it is in the current economic and political struggles, in rallying the masses for the building of a broad coalition of all democratic forces for political action independent of the two major parties. But the complete rejection of Browderism by the Communist Party does not relegate the struggle against revisionism, or its profound lessons, to the category of an interesting phenomenon to be reviewed academically as a matter of past history. The struggle to root out all remnants of Browder's revisionism, the struggle against all forms of opportunism, is a continuing one. It is part and parcel of the process by which our party is making itself a mass, fighting Communist Party. It accompanies our fight today on all fronts and is a precondition for the successful waging of this fight. The lessons of the struggle against revisionism are not dusty lessons about the past. They are, above all, lessons for today and for tomorrow. The documents, articles, and speeches collected in this booklet summarize the chief points of the enormously rich discussion carried on in the freest possible fashion by the membership of the Communist Party in the whole period prior to and culminating in the Special National Convention in July 1945, which, with the exception of the lone vote of Earl Browder, repudiated his revisionist theories and policies and reconstituted the Communist Party. A careful study of the documents, articles and speeches collected in this booklet will reveal the nature and essence of the system of revisionist theories and policies rejected by the Communist Party. And these documents, articles, and speeches must be so studied because they represent what is, from now on, an indispensable element in the education and development of all those who wish to master Marxism-Leninism. Browder's revision of Marxism-Leninism was not confined to one or another individual question, but represented a whole system of ideas, the different aspects of which were put forth with a greater or lesser degree of theoretical elaboration. This system of ideas comprised, in the main, the following elements. 1. 
Rejection of the Marxist theory of the class struggle and its replacement by the concept of a harmony of interests between the working class and the capitalist class. Abandonment of the class struggle in favor of a policy of class collaboration and class peace. 2. Rejection of Lenin's analysis of imperialism as the final stage in the development of capitalism, as moribund capitalism. An advocacy of the theory of the ending of the epoch of imperialism, of the development of monopoly capitalism as a progressive force in society. 3. Rejection of the Marxist analysis of the laws of development of capitalist economy, in particular, the inevitability of unemployment and crises under capitalism, and the advocacy of the bourgeois political economy of the Keynesian school. 4. Rejection of the Marxist-Leninist theory of the state, leading to the idealization of bourgeois democracy, and falsification of the real relation of the trusts and monopolies to the development of fascism. 5. Rejection of the Marxist-Leninist theory of the national and colonial question as reflected in the abandonment of the principle of the right of self-determination for the Negro people, and in the advocacy of a theory of colonial liberation through arrangements between imperialist powers. 6. Rejection of the Marxist-Leninist concept of the role of the working class as the most decisive and the leading force in modern society, subordinating it to the, quote, liberal bourgeoisie, which is declared to be the most decisive force in modern society. Comment, if that doesn't flag Browderism as basically working to advance capitalist ideology, I don't know what does. Remember, we can understand social democracy as the entrance of bourgeois or capitalist ideas into the workers' movement, and revisionism as the entrance of capitalist ideas into the communist movement. Continuing, 7. Rejection of the goal of socialism as the ultimate aim of the working class and the substitution for it of a liberal bourgeois utopia. 8. Rejection of the Marxist-Leninist philosophical standpoint of dialectical materialism and the adoption in its place of a voluntarist, pragmatic standpoint. Abandonment of the struggle on the theoretical front against hostile and alien ideological influences, coupled with a gross distortion of the relationship between theory and practice. 9. Dissolution of the Communist Party, representing a complete abandonment of all Marxist-Leninist teachings on the necessity for, the nature and role of, the vanguard party of the working class, the Communist Party. Violation of the principles of democratic centralism and the establishment of bureaucracy as a system of work in the vanguard party of the working class. It is clear from all this that despite its specific features, which bear the imprint of the special relation of forces existing internationally and within the United States on the basis of which this revisionist system arose and developed, Browder's revisionism is, in its fundamentals, a continuation and further development under new conditions of the revisionism of Bernstein, Kautsky, Bukharin, and Lovestone. The bourgeois influences and pressures which generate tendencies to revisionism, as typified by Browder, are inherent in the situation in which the working class and its vanguard communist party in all capitalist countries lives and fights today. This is shown by the varying degrees of influence exerted by Browderite policies on a number of communist parties in certain countries outside of the U.S. These influences and pressures manifested themselves with particular acuteness in the United States, first, because of the influence of the whole Roosevelt decade, and secondly, because American imperialism is the strongest imperialist power within a generally weakened world capitalist system. But the fact that such a system of revisionism actually dominated the policies of the Communist Party of the United States for a period of time comment, get ready for Khrushchev, continuing, is a result of the fact that the communists in the United States have not yet fully mastered and completely assimilated the teachings of Marxism-Leninism. The struggle to master Marxist-Leninist theory in the course of the gigantic struggles in which the working class is now engaged, and in which the Communist Party is playing a vital and indispensable role, is therefore a supreme conclusion to be drawn from the struggle against Browder's revisionism. The materials collected in this booklet must be studied on the basis of an intensified study and restudy of the teachings and writings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, especially Lenin's articles on revisionism, which are now being published by international publishers in a special edition to its Little Lenin Library series, Stalin's Mastering Bolshevism, Lenin's Imperialism, Stalin's Foundations of Leninism, and the classic History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolsheviks. Armed and equipped with that knowledge, we can and will go forward to the more rapid building of a mass fighting communist party capable of successfully fulfilling all the heavy responsibilities which history places upon its shoulders.
And that's the end of the audiobook. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We're just getting started. Lots more to come in this mini series on first wave U.S. anti revisionism. I think that, especially judging from the state of the CPUSA today, we have a lot to learn and a lot of tasks to be worked out. I hope that this series and this channel in general helps to facilitate that process. All right, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, and they allow me to spend a lot more time focusing on this channel, planning content, and in general, ensuring that it continues to grow. Also, engagement counts, so like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment, even if it's thanks, good video, or just random letters. All of that helps to boost this channel and this video in the algorithm so that it's easier for people to stumble across this content, and we want to keep it spreading. We need this conversation to keep expanding, especially as capitalism appears to be heading into another major, possibly 2008-style crisis. Thanks again, and we will see you in the next video.